I'm Nathan Gray, and you're watching Three Points. Recently, I got to sit down with Mr. Andrew Nutter, who's running for Oklahoma State Senate representative. We talked about what it's like running as an independent here in Oklahoma and many other interesting subjects right here on Three Points. Andrew, for everybody watching, tell, let's start off by just telling me who you are and why we're meeting here today and uh, what you've got going on. So my name is Andrew Nutter. I'm currently a candidate for State Senate District number 37. Um, so you can vote for me November 5th. I'll be on the ballot. Um, one thing a lot of people don't know is what a state senate representative does for their city because there's different areas, right? The city's broken it for yeah, state senate versus the House of Representative. I mean, it works kind of the same as like the federal Congress. We have two houses um, and then the governor. So yeah, we'd be one of 48 members in the Senate um, for I believe that's right. <laughs> so helping decide things as bills come out. Yeah, and just mostly the Senate is in charge of the budget and things like that, right, writing the budget bill, whereas most of the laws that get written kind of originate in the House of Representatives for the state. So, yeah, so mo mostly you're sitting on committees for different things. Um, education, obviously, um, is a hot button one. But, um, yeah, all, all the different things that make your state function. The Senate is kind of allocating that money and sitting on different committees and making sure that, you know, they might initiate different studies to see where the money is going to be spent, things like that. And you're running as an independent outside of the duopoly, which has a stronghold in the state, but more, one more than the other, right? Well, how, how, what brought you to uh, decide to run it as an independent and um, what sort of challenges or hurdles do you uh, predict to face along the way because of so so to me I mean yeah we need more independent voices so that's why I chose to run as an independent um, what we basically see all the time is a lot of stagnation a lot of political infighting or you see just straight corruption or misappropriation from one party and people within that same party don't really want to call out that that misappropriation because they're trying to win political points they're trying to keep their party you know in power and we see that with both parties so I mean my main thing is corruption like I see all the time that you know these government contracts go to friends of friends or the money just straight gets embezzled and just disappears off the books and so you know a lot of those things to me are really concerning um, neither party seems to want to really have the backbone to call out even members of their own party um, and really say to those people like, you know, this is unacceptable even though you're a member of my own party. So that's kind of what I hope to bring to the situation is a little bit of clarity, a little bit of people, you know, I want to be a straight shooter. I, I don't want to favor one side or the other. And I think most people are fed up with that two-party system I mean people talk about it all the time so now here's a chance to vote for somebody who is independent you know I'm not gonna take money from either party or heck I might take money from both parties um, you know if they want to give it <laughs> but you know the point is to not be beholden to that money you mentioned a misallocation of funds and recently it's come up that some three million I think it is in in uh, Bible's money for public schools yeah, has kind of gone six it's up to six million now they were asking for for Bibles and, but wasn't the three has kind of like already kind of gone in the gray or am I missing that story I think there is a little bit of time to um, you know to make a change on that but I'm not exactly sure I know extra money was asked for but you know I mean it's really a question that the founding fathers decided for this country years ago they they said separation of church and state was a good thing I, I don't think you could find anyone who you know from that time back then that would endorse this you know what I mean I mean Thomas Jefferson was you know staunchly against Christianity being a part of the government and I think most of the founding fathers kind of understood why um, so again we're kind of you know, we're debating things that have already really been settled in America. I feel like most people don't really want this to go through in Oklahoma. You know, you have a lot of people from the right and the left kind of understanding that, you know, again, we're scoring political points. You know, we're not we're not doing something that's really going to benefit the educational system. You know, we have literacy problems. We have math problems. We're behind in all kinds of standards. And so, you know, what's the priority do we want to sit around and you know 
do something that's going to get us maybe higher office or national attention or something like that? Or do we want to do something that's actually going to benefit, you know, people on the ground, the teachers and the students that, you know, that are grossly, uh, you know, underfunded right now. So, you know, $6 million for Bibles or $6 million for math books, you know. So you're saying maybe it was a misspend or <laughs> could be used better perhaps? Uh, you know, this is one of those things that we keep seeing often where, you know, a lawsuit is going to come from this. And so then we're just wasting money on top of money. And, uh, you know, most common sense people aren't interested in these debates. Like they want to move on to the actual, you know, meat and potatoes of how do we get these kids to read more and better, <laughs> you know? So it, it's a distraction. More and more, I keep seeing common ground, common ground between what was formerly known as progressive leftist and the old principles of such, as well as the things that libertarians espouse to and even what most Republicans wish they could have for their country. Everybody seems to find common ground for three years, three and a half years, and agree that the that the presidents are sort of just a, a puppet to, to it all, or they're playing their role, that there's other people in charge, but then every four years, they fall into the same sort of cycle or they forget. We're in a sort of pitched battle situation with the presidential election. I mean, obviously it matters, but we have both parties with massive amount of voters who are just going to show up for those elections. What we don't have is people showing up for the local elections. I mean, we have a mayoral race. We have all these different legislative um, races occurring right now. We have county commissioner going on. Um, so all these races get, you know, maybe a 10 or 15 percent turnout for the local population. Whereas you look at the presidential election, usually it's around more like 50 percent, 60 percent, I believe this last time. So, you know, if we're going to talk about how local politics matter and local voting matters, then we actually have to get out and vote. And I think, you know, part of my platform is to really um, emphasize getting out to vote advertising more when these election days are coming around so people really do know that you know that it's time to vote they can do absentee they can do early voting um, you know you're allowed as an employer to give your employees time off during the day on election day to go vote and we need to you know emphasize that um, I'm all for making election day a national holiday so that everyone can be off and go exercise their duty you know as a citizen and vote because that really will be the thing that, that you know, moves the mark on, on where we're at. Because if we don't get more voices in and we just let the same voices kind of control what's being said and the narrative and what's getting done, we're not going to make any progress. So, you know, it's fine to say progressive, liberal, you know, conservative, whatever. And, but I feel like within all those movements, you can find things that, that everyone agrees on. I don't think it's it's hard to find people that would say, you know, I don't want to be fiscally conservative. You know, everybody wants to save money. Everyone wants to spend money smartly and get good value for it, you know. And, you know, too many times we're just we're pitched against each other with these culture war issues and things like that. And a lot of times that's getting glossed over um, the other more serious issues. You know, we're, we're taking things that fire people up and using that again to score these political points instead of to move something forward to create solutions that people that every people everyday people and every person in america can really benefit from so. and i've noticed that on your website you know on your website you, you the the education and the voting are two big things what would you say out of all your all of your policies is your most like your number one passion project and then how do you, how do you sort of aim to accomplish that from from the state senate rep or what sort of you know actual things do you get to do at that level that you think will will help move the ball forward uh, in that issue so yeah so a big one you know for everyone is education i would say you know if you can't read, you can't learn, you can't, you know, be a productive citizen, you're not going to be able to understand, you know, media literacy is like a huge thing right now where people are falling for fake news all the time, falling for the deep fake videos. So we need to start there and make sure that everyone can read at, you know, better than a fifth grade level. They say something like 50% of Americans can read fifth, at a fifth grade level or below and about 
13 to 15 percent are illiterate, functionally illiterate. So, I mean, those are huge numbers, really, when you think about the number of people that are affected. Um, the main thing with education is we should be capturing any federal dollars that we can. You know, we need to um, do better with our grant writing system and people that are writing those grants and applying for that money because we're missing those dollars all the time. And, and that could really, um, you know, change, you know, as far as teachers not having to pay for supplies, things like that. But also I think there needs to be um, a little bit more of a dem democratic way that we are um, doing this, the state school board. I'm suggesting that we make some of those board member positions, all of them really um, electable, you know, not just the state superintendent. Um, and I feel like we should expand the seats. You know, it, it shouldn't just be five or six people in a room. It should be a real plurality of voices, a lot of different perspectives, because that's that's the people of our state. Like, you know, despite um, you know, what, what, however we vote in the presidential election, there are a lot of different voices in this state. So not listening to them, to those voices is um, a detriment to what, you know, our state is doing moving forward. Um, you know, that can come from the tribal um, leaders. It can come from, you know, all the diversity that we have in the state. But if we're not looking to educate everyone equally, I feel like we're you know, that's something that we're always failing at. Reforming the OSDE, that's the Oklahoma State Department of Education, making sure that, you know, we have some sort of, um, you know, mechanism that when things start to seem out of control, we're not just left with, you know, nothing to do and we're watching money go out the door, things like that. Um, but yeah, capturing federal dollars is a huge one for me because we're either missing those or we're turning them down and really these are no strings attached money that we're just turning away and and yet our state budget is mostly federal dollars already um, you know what we generate from taxes and fees in the state I think makes up less than half of, of our total state budget so we're looking at federal dollars that we're already taking in and we're playing games and saying, you know, oh, this, you know, this money we maybe don't want this time and this money we will take. But, you know, so when we, when we pass things like the sales, you know, we, we just recently got the, rid of the sales tax on groceries. That's a great step because, you know, it does um, affect poor and working class people more, that, that sales tax. But, you know, then they brag and they say we've got this huge surplus of budget at that point. But... That's, that's a lot of federal dollars coming in, you know, so that's, that's Biden money, you know, we can, and you can't say you didn't take Biden money and for the school lunch program because it was Biden money, but you'll take all the other Biden money. And, and that's kind of the political games that we're, we're playing here a lot. And, you know, that's why we need somebody who's outside of that system who can say, you know, yeah, no matter who is, in, you know, no matter who the president is, this is federal, no strings attached money that will benefit us in all kinds of different ways, food programs, education programs, you know, health care, you name it. And, you know, for us to kind of say, like, we'll turn away this money and take this money, it's, it's really disingenuous. So to me, that's that's why I want to be down there and be a voice for that to say, you know, does this make sense? You know, and a lot of times it does just doesn't. So. So what brings a boy from South Tulsa and Jinx to, to want to become a man who wants to run for state senate? And, and not only that, um, what does it mean to sort of take on this independent stance in the Oklahoma state senate, which is predominantly, I'd imagine, Republican? And how, does, how do people, like, like you said in your, in your post, a lot of people don't know that all these uh, seats are often uncontested. And, and what are the specific ways that you, like, really get into it? Like, how did, you know... Um, Sorry, that's a triple question, but yeah. um, so I mean, I guess my upbringing was always, uh, you know, my dad was into history. My grandfather was a journalist um, and actually owned his own newspaper for a little while. So to me, it was kind of in the blood a little bit. Um, my dad was, you know, always worked in city government and he kind of held various positions. Um, you know, never elected positions, but he was always in the, I guess you would say the bureaucracy. 
Um, so a little bit of that, a little bit of knowing a little bit of, you know, of, of the history of our country and, and kind of the potential that, you know, that we see. Um, I mean, I was raised in the church. So, you know, to me, those ideas like loving thy neighbor, you know, do unto others. Um, and, and, you know, being a good citizen, being conscientious of what's happening um, around you, that was kind of instilled from me, uh, in me from a young age. So, you know, then you grow up and you kind of realize that a lot of these promises and a lot of these um, ideals that, that people are telling you that we should live by are really kind of thrown to the wayside, um, you know, in the marketplace. Um, you know, you go out and you have to make money and you have to do things that, um, you know, maybe you, maybe you wouldn't, you know, think about doing unless you were kind of put in these positions. You know, from there, it just kind of grew, being aware of social movements. Um, I've always been a big fan of hip-hop music, which, you know, if you know some of the earlier music, um, you know, was very conscious rap, um, Karis One, Public Enemy, um, even up through, you know, the 90s with, you know, Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul and all these great groups that um, really were teaching me things about their perspective. Um, but also I could recognize a lot of things that I would see, you know, just living in Tulsa where, you know, you see the racism and you see different things like that. I mean, um, you know, so I, I think it's really interesting, like when when something racist or something horrible happens in a town like Tulsa or or the thing that happened down in Tishmingo um, recently and and people come out of the woodwork and they say, that's not who we are. And, you know, my lived experience is one of meeting people that are very openly racist and don't have a problem being that way. So I kind of wonder sometimes, you know, at what point do we say, like, can we meet these ideals that we've been having our whole lives of loving their na our neighbor and treating others the way we want to be treated? And, and how do we, you know, reconcile that with the deeply racist history of our country and, you know, the things that we're scared to still teach our kids. Um, you know, the, the race massacre was something that my high school actually did talk about, which I think is unique because um, we're still talking about the 90s at that, at that point. Um, and finding that out is, is, you know, heartbreaking at that age when you realize that, you know, all these dots can be connected even from 1921 all up to what we're experiencing today. Um, of, you know, things that should have been corrected and history that, you know, maybe was known but wasn't told. Um, so to me, that's just it. You know, I, like I'm a big student of history. Um, I've, I've all, was also raised, you know, in the church. I was a Boy Scout for many years. And just having that moral upbringing, but then watching people kind of betray it as an adult, um, has been, you know, a struggle for me, like my whole life, you know, watching, watching these great values and these great, um, you know, things be talked about. But then you, you know, you go downtown or you go almost anywhere in the city and you see homeless people and you see people whose houses are falling into the ground, you know, and, and who's there to help them, you know? So I want to be that voice, you know, for people that that are working class, that, you know, don't, you know, really understand why government can't help people more or why we can't push private interests to not take so much and leave more for us and for peop the people, the hardworking people that work for these private interests, you know. Um, so it's just one of those things where, you know, a, a society that's better than this is out there. And I'm not going to go down to Oklahoma City and say that I'm going to be the one to to bring it about, because, like you said, like we're up against a lot of career politicians and and people that have really no interest in changing things. But if I can be, you know, at least a little bit of a spark down there, a little bit of an opposition, a little bit of harm reduction, something that's going to say that we're just not going to roll over every time that you want to give a tax break to a big corporation or you want to, you know, give a federal money government giveaway to, you know, a religious school. Like we need to be focusing on the things that like everyone is kind of dealing with 
on a day to day basis. And, and right now, you know, that's, that's a, the economy, you know, is kicking everyone's butt. Um, and when we get wrapped up in these, you know, debates of Bibles and, and all these other hot button issues, you know, we're, we're ignoring the problems of the homeless people on the street who, you know, according to the statistics, something like 60 to or so percent of, of people that are experiencing homelessness are veterans. So that's a betrayal that we've, you know, gone back and said that we were going to take care of these people that fought for our country or served in whatever capacity. And, and then we let them, you know, to their own devices once they were out of the army and, or, or whatever they served in. And, you know, so generations of them there's yeah generations of them we're not fulfilling those promises and and we have the money i mean we always have the money they always find the money for these things so it's just a matter of prioritizing and you know not letting people play political games anymore and and drive us apart Um, there's much more commonality i feel like and there's much more of these big broad ideas that make sense to a lot of people and, and we can make those things happen and we don't have to have, um, you know, home ownership as low as it is and poverty as high as it is and eviction rates like they are. We don't have to do that. Um, the money's there to, to fix it. We just have to have the, the strength to stand up to the, some of these special interests that have kind of told us that, that, you know, that we can't have those nice things. So. Man, this has been a great meeting. This yeah. has been wonderful talking with you, Andrew, and this has been w- wonderful getting to know you better and for people to get to know Andrew better. Um, Andrew, just one last thing. Do you have any any last words, anything you want to plug, uh, your website perhaps at least, and um, uh, hit them with it? Uh, so, yeah, vote for me November 5th. I'll be in District 37. It's West Tulsa, Sand Springs, Jinx, if you live in any of those areas. Uh, look for me on the ballot. Uh, independent candidate. Um, also, I want to say it's nutterforok.com is the website. You can see all my policies on there. It's, it's pretty detailed. Um, my cell phone number is on the website if you feel like calling me and, and uh, you know, yelling at me or saying that you agree, whatever. I'm, I'm down to hear the criticism. Um, there's also an email on there. And also, I would want to plug a couple people. I think Monroe Nichols should be our next mayor. I would definitely vote for him. Um, If you're looking for a county commissioner, Sarah Gray is a great candidate, Um, again, on the west side of Tulsa. A lot of the other races are actually decided for my district. Uh, My House of Representatives person has already been picked. My city councilor has already been picked. So so there's just a few things left for for my side of town. But but those are the people that really I feel like are coming with plans and coming with um, new ideas that that Tulsa really should... um, should check out so definitely check out both those candidates and and vote get out and vote november 5th and if you feel like running for office check out you know when the next time you can get on that there's school board there's city council there's there's all kinds of opportunities so you know we we don't have a lot of people running so the more the better let's do it let's all run well i'm nathan gray we've been here with andrew nutter you've been watching three points